because the two chapters that we have just discussed in Ezekiel 22 and 23 pronounce with unashamed directness the disgusting and repulsive sins of Israel, that's the topic that I've got to bring to your attention today, sin, the doctrine of sin. But the good news about this topic is that we have the gospel according to Ezekiel before us. The whole book, when we see Ezekiel in its entirety, we do see the whole gospel. The book of Ezekiel uses many images and parables and promises to communicate God's gospel. He uses a lot of words. But before I give you a brief overview of the gospel according to Ezekiel, I want to show you a visual aid that doesn't use any words, except I'm going to use words to explain what it means. So perhaps you are aware of the wordless book that shows the gospel. And each color represents something that we must understand of the gospel. So there are the words that go with the colors. Gold represents God's holiness his deity, and that we must be holy to be in his presence. And what's the problem? The problem is black shows us sin. It shows us it and represents sin separating us from God and leading to eternal death. Black, the color of death. And then red represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed when he gave his life as a substitute for us. What happened after that? Because of Jesus' blood shed on the cross, white represents the forgiveness, the acceptance, the purification that we get from the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness. And this we receive when we confess that we're sinners and that we have a problem and that Jesus died in our place, took our place. Green is the next color. Don't forget this about the gospel. Once you know Jesus, then you are to grow in faith and God transforms us into the image of his son. Uh, how does he do that? By his Holy Spirit. As we read his word, we pray, we trust him. He allows trials. He answers prayers. We grow in faith. And then... I've added blue just for fun. Some add this and some don't, but this color represents heaven and shows us that we will be in God's presence. And that is a blessing of salvation and the gospel. And maybe you've heard you should preach the gospel to yourself every day. You can think through the different colors, what it, these colors mean to help you do that. Now, I will review how the book of Ezekiel presents the gospel to us. In chapter 1, and I don't have this on the handout, I mean on, on the screen. In chapter 1, Ezekiel shows us that God is holy and glorious and he is not like anyone or anything on earth. Do you remember chapter 1, the vision of the glory of the Lord, fire, light, his holiness shows up there. And then in chapters 2 through 24, this big chunk that we've been in ever since chapter 1, <laughs> these show us that Israel is everything except holy, not glorious. Israel is a nation trapped in sin. Israel's kings and priests and prophets and all the people are all sinners. That is the problem that they have. God's been telling them, you have a problem. Turn from this. They are sinners who will be held accountable for their actions. And then in the next big chunk of Ezekiel, chapters 25 through 32, judgment against the nations. This section is also about sinners who will be held accountable for their actions. And then the rest of the book is about God's grace and blessings that come as a result of his grace. And it is so exciting when we get to Ezekiel chapter 36 and we see the promise of him pouring out his Holy Spirit. And while the book of Ezekiel doesn't tell us about the death of Jesus on the cross and his blood paying for our sins, his promise of the Holy Spirit and us receiving the Holy Spirit is a result of Jesus' death on the cross. So we 
learn more as we study all of God's Word. So today I want to discuss the topic of sin. As we've been through Ezekiel, we have discussed and thought about the doctrine of God, theology. We've thought about the doctrine of Christ, which is Christology. We've thought about the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That's pneumatology. And today, the formal word for the doctrine of sin is hamartiology. Hamartiology. Sometimes I say harmatiology, which kind of makes sense because sin harms us. But this is the way you spell it, homartiology. So sin is that thing that harms us. It's not a fun topic. But if you and I don't have the right understanding of sin, then we really will have our whole biblical worldview skewed in the wrong direction. So let's cover first things first. The history of sin. I know you're in Bible study because you know sin is a problem. <laughs> and we all need to pay attention to God's words to us and turn away from sin. So the problem of sin is not new to you, but we have to remember the gravity of sin and the grossness of sin. The entrance of sin into the human race was not a legend. It was, it was truly a historical event. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 give the actual account of what the first man on earth, Adam, what he did. God saw all that he had created and it was all good. And in that situation, Adam and Eve sinned. God gave Adam and Eve one stipulation in the garden. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Satan tempted them, he did so appealing to their desire for knowledge. So think about that as we look at Genesis 3, 4, and 5. The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. So Adam and Eve were not tempted to rebel against God like Oh, just forget what he said. Don't worry about it. Just, just do what you want to do anyway. They were tempted with something that sounded like it would be good for them. And that should be a warning signal for us today regarding temptation and sin. Sin and Satan and self are going to come packaged in a way that looks like it will be good for us. Thoughts, ideas, things that appeal. Be skeptical about everything except God's word. The act of sin itself is described very briefly in one verse in Genesis. So we see one brief act impacting all of mankind. Genesis 3, 6 through 7. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The fruit looked good. Eve ate it. Gave it to Adam. Adam ate it. And immediately they knew. They knew good and evil. They knew the good they had had in the garden and they knew the evil that they had just committed. They knew they were naked. They knew they were exposed and they knew they would be found out. They tried to hide, but there is no hiding from God. What we see next is that the first sin of man was met immediately with the judgment of God. Satan, Eve, and Adam each received the punishment that God considered appropriate for the sin. And the ultimate judgment was expulsion from the garden. The ultimate judgment was separation from the Lord, a break in fellowship with him. We see this in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man saying, 
from any of the tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the eat the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. And you know Adam and Eve did not drop dead in the garden. But God said they would die. So what was this death that he said they would experience? It was not physical death. It was spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from God. Eternal death is separation from God. Wayne Grudem says, We should note that all sin is ultimately irrational. It really did not make sense for Adam and Eve to think there could be any gain in disobeying the words of their creator. They made a foolish choice. Though people sometimes persuade themselves that they have good reasons for sinning, when examined in the cold light of the truth on the last day, it will be seen in every case that sin ultimately just does not make sense. Sin does not make sense. Say it with me. Sin does not make sense. Easy to remember. Keep telling yourself that. Easy to tell your kids. Tell your husband to remind you sin does not make sense. Well, that's the historical account of the first sin on earth. Now let's consider the impact of sin. From this point in the garden and through the rest of history, every man and every woman is born outside the garden and every man and woman is born spiritually dead, separated from God. This is the depravity of man and it's summarized in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. A few sad facts about the depravity of man. Depravity is total. And that phrase covers the next couple of things that I will say. This particular section, depravity is total. It extends to every person. So it's total like all mankind is born into the world in a state of depravity. First Kings 8, 46 says there is no one who does not sin. Psalm 143, 2. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Proverbs 29. Who can say, I have kept my heart pure. I am clean and without sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. So this depravity, the sin nature is in every person. The total course of humankind. Depravity affects both thinking and living. It's a basic heart problem. Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can understand it. And in Mark 7 20 Jesus talks about the heart. What comes out of a person is what defiles him for from within out of the heart of man come a horrible list of sinful actions, thoughts, behaviors, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So depravity, sin nature, is in us. It's also a basic mind problem. Sin, depravity is a mind problem. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in Ephesians 4, 17, Paul says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And just think about that word futility. It means emptiness. It's not going to accomplish anything. Futile. The thoughts of their mind. The thoughts of the sin-saturated mind and behavior is going to bring nothing good. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. 
They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. While that first sin in the garden appealed to Adam and Eve's desire for knowledge. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't change it. For, <laughs> there's Ephesians. Um, in verse 18, it says, the ignorance that is in them. Sin brings ignorance. Like you don't know what's going on. Instead of having knowledge, you don't have knowledge of God that you need. So, depravity is the horrible, desperate condition of all mankind. You should ask the question, is man basically good or basically bad? And what do you think the answer is? If you answer it according to the Bible, before salvation, man is basically bad. But not everyone answers that question that way. Walk down the street. Is man basically good or bad? He's good. Man's good. That's not what the Bible tells us. Mankind is not evolving to a higher state of principles and ethics and standards and scruples. Mankind is not progressing to a better state of goodness, decency, integrity, honor, and virtue. But actually, mankind really isn't getting any worse either. From the beginning, the sin nature has made man wicked. Wicked before the flood, everybody needed to be wiped out. That's not happening right now. I mean, we look around and maybe we feel like God should send the flood and wipe people out. Praise God for his mercy and patience and love and the offer of salvation. And let us have that perspective as well. What's happening is the world is just accepting sin as a normal behavior. And they're telling each other it's okay. Well, let's remind ourselves now of the definition of sin. It is basically a disposition of the heart. That's what the verses that I've already shown you have um, taught us. But sin is specifically a thought, an act, and an omission. It's a thought, a thought that goes against the truth of God's word or the truth of what God has commanded. So you can think something and that thought is a sin. Think about bitterness. Bitterness is, it's possible to act out in bitterness, but you can be bitter and that bitterness is a sin. Envy is a sin. Rage, unbelief is a sin. Self-centeredness, selfishness, that's a sin thought. You're thinking about yourself. You may act out on that, but it's starting in your thoughts. Idolatry, lust, these things can go on in your head. And just because you're keeping it in your thoughts doesn't mean that it's not a sin. But sin is also an act. When that act goes against God's commands and principles. An act of sin was committed against me when I went to New York City several years ago. God says, thou shalt not steal. I didn't steal, but someone stole from me. He stole my subway card um, with a sleight of hand movement. I was having a little bit of trouble getting it to work through the turnstile. And he came and he ran it through for me. And I guess he used mine because I had just filled up and had a brand new card worth seven days unlimited rides. And uh, he came and helped me. And I ended up with his empty card, which I found out on the next ride. So I paid for his subway rides for that week, right? And I had to buy another card. When I shared this story on Facebook, and one of the reasons I share that with you now is because someone commented, stinking sinner. <laughs> yeah, it was an act of sin committed against me. The sin nature was in action. I learned my lesson and realized I better not let anyone else help me. <laughs> Just keep my hands in my pockets, keep my cards in my pockets. Sin is also an omission. It's not always doing something, but it's not doing what you should do. In Ezekiel 22, 26, we had an example of that regarding the priests. I don't think, no, it's not up there. The Lord said about the priests, 
They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. So the priests omitted what they should have done. And now I have a few definitions of sin from some theologians. Erickson says, Sin is any lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God. This may be a matter of act, of thought, or of inner disposition or state. Wayne Grudem says, Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. If you sit on that sentence and think about that, that will be very convicting. Any failure to conform to the moral law of God in your attitudes. What are your attitudes? Ryrie says, sin is missing the mark. It's badness, rebellion, iniquity, going astray, wickedness, wandering, ungodliness, crime, lawlessness, transgression, ignorance, and a falling away. He didn't leave anything out. Martin Luther said, Sin is an inclination to evil, a disgust at the good, a disinclination toward light and wisdom. It is love of error and darkness, a fleeing from good works and a loathing of them, a running to what is evil. And I hope that you don't know how to have someone personally involved in your life that is behaving this way but there are people in the world that are doing just this and uh, we should grieve over it uh, cringe at it and pray for them but know that they are walking in living out sin their sin nature all of these definitions describe the natural state of every person without Jesus Christ and it explains the problems in the world today. When you look around and you wonder, what's going on? Why is all this happening? Sin is happening. Mankind is either in this terrible state of sin or being transformed out of this state into the likeness of Christ. That describes those who know Jesus. So while Christians are being transformed, we still sin. So that means there's a lot of sinning going on. Sinning from those who don't know Jesus. Sinning from those who do know Jesus. Let's stop the sin. That's why we're thinking about it today. Just to, to check our behavior. What is the consequence of sin? Romans 5.18 says, One trespass led to condemnation for all men. John 3.16-18 tells us something, but... Uh, Think about this whole verse, this whole passage as I read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Perish is the consequence of sin. Perishing, dying eternally, eternal separation from God. That is the destiny for all men without Jesus. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So if we look at this whole passage, God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. Every man born, every woman born, every cute, sweet little baby is born a sinner with a need. Well, what does God do about all of this sin? He offers opportunities for repentance. Why? Exodus 34, 6 tells us he is the Lord, our God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is his character. And he acts towards sinners based on who he is. He offers opportunities for repentance and change. 
But if that offer is rejected, if his grace is rejected, a day of reckoning will come. And that's why this Ezekiel 22 verse is up here. That's where we find the nation of Israel. Her time is up. She has rejected repentance. The Lord says in verse 4, You have become guilty by the blood you have shed and defiled by the idols that you have made, and you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. Because of sin, the nation of Israel would drink the cup of the wrath of God. And he has been making it very clear for these 24 chapters, Israel has sinned against him. In chapter 23, verses 32 through 35, this is what the Lord, sovereign Lord says, you will drink your sister's cup. And he's referring to Samaria, the northern kingdom who has already been judged for their behavior and sin. You will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision for it holds so much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it dry. You will dash it to pieces and tear your breasts. I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you have forgotten me and thrust me behind your back, you must bear the consequences of your lewdness and prostitution. So he's talking about drinking the cup of his wrath. Psalm 75, 8 describes the cup of the wrath of God this way. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Whoever sins against the Lord must drink the cup of his wrath. Unless someone else drinks it for you. Because of our sin, Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God. He said to his disciples in Matthew twenty two twenty, Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? And we see him thinking about this in Matthew twenty six, thirty eight through forty two. He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is in the garden. After the Last Supper, he is about to be arrested. He says, stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. I have this book called Contemplating the Cross, and in it the author imagines this moment and what it might have felt like for Jesus as he contemplates the cup. The father holds out his hand, but it clutches a bitter cup. Jesus glances into its depths. The contents would be vile, filthy, nauseating, even to those who had tasted sin. But to the Christ, whose heart is undefiled, the stench of it fills the air, the dark substance looming over him like an oozing sore. Perhaps he envisions himself taking the cup, drinking its bitter dregs until the poison of sin infects his whole body. In the garden, Jesus accepted the cup of God's wrath. As he was betrayed and arrested, he drank the cup. As he was tried before Sanhedrin and Pilate, he drank the cup. As he was scourged and mocked and spit upon, he drank it. And as he was nailed to the cross, he drank the cup of God's wrath. As the sky was dark and he was forsaken, he drank the full cup of God's wrath. And experienced separation from his father. The cup that he drank belonged to me. It belonged to you. We were supposed to drink that cup because of our sin. But 
But because of Jesus' sacrifice, we're given a new cup, not the cup of God's wrath, but the cup of the new covenant. In Matthew 20, 26, 27 and 28, it says, When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus for the sins of mankind. The blood of Jesus was poured out upon the cross for forgiveness of the sins of mankind. When you grasp the degree of your depravity and the magnitude of God's wrath and then realize that someone else experienced what you deserved, then you begin to appreciate the sacrifice of Christ so much more. We can think on this and we should. We should think on the sin that Jesus took upon himself, but we cannot know the fullness we can try to imagine, but we come at it from having the background of a sin nature. We've had sin in our lives. Jesus experienced it from perfect, holy nature. How disgusting, how horrendous was it for him to take that cup? Sin destroyed fellowship with the Lord and our Savior restored that fellowship. Sin serves a cup of God's wrath, but our Savior serves a cup of blessing so that we can sit down with him. As is said in Psalm 23, five and six, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, a cup of blessing. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the gospel according to Ezekiel. God is holy. Man is sinful. God makes a way for change. Can't do it ourselves, but God makes a way. And then blessings abound. Blessings abound for us. Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Praise God. Let's pray and praise Him. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, You are the Holy One, seated on Your holy throne, in Your holy place, Your heaven. It is perfect there, and thank You, Thank you, Jesus, that you have opened the way for us through your blood, through your sacrifice, through your perfectly obedient and holy life. Thank you that you have made a way for us to be cleansed from sin and rescued from this depravity and sin nature. Help us understand and grasp as much as we can the degree of what we have been rescued from. Help us abhor sin. Help us cling to you and all that is good and walk in your good ways, your perfect law, your love, your holiness. We will be different. We will look different. We may be misunderstood. I pray, Lord, that this uh, thinking on the doctrine of sin this morning will help us as we watch what's going on in the world around us Give us a biblical worldview, a biblical perspective, your perspective on how people act, why they do what they do, and how we should respond to them. Thank you for your word, your truth. It's uh, fresh, meaningful, important, appropriate. We need to hear from you every day. Thank you that you do communicate to us. Thank you for your love for us. Jesus, thank you for what you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.